Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Vin, and today we're talking about the first American Gothic novel, Wheeland by Charles Brockton Brown. So this was the first novel, uh, first, I guess, successful novel of Charles Brockton Brown. Um, you can see some of the other ones that he wrote and published afterwards that did achieve some levels of success. Uh, Brown was really one of America's first novelists, uh, at least native-born novel novelist. Uh, Wheeland was published in 1798, and it is most certainly within the realm of the Gothic. Uh, of course, it's an American Gothic story. Uh, so one of the things that Brown does is transfer a lot of the Gothic tropes from the Europe, uh, you know, over to the U.S. So instead of uh, crumbling abbeys, uh, you know, monastic houses and Gothic cathedrals. Uh, instead, he has a religious zealot who builds a temple uh, out, I don't know, like the Pennsylvania frontier. Um, somebody who thought that they were going to be able to convert Native Americans and is unsuccessful in doing that. But uh, nevertheless, it gives us at least some kind of religious gothic structure um, and he does manage to put in some things from Europe uh, that we had seen in earlier gothic literature and transfer it to the U.S. like uh, a little bit of anti-Catholicism. Um, we do have one kind of mysterious character named Carwin who spent some time in Spain uh, and converted to Catholicism and comes in so he's already kind of a, a figure of suspicion in that way. Uh, but really it's not just Catholicism that is um, to be, uh, you know, cautioned against. Uh, there's two themes that run throughout this book, um, and it's inspired by a true story, which I'll talk about towards the end. But there's two themes that run through this. The first one is religious extremism. Uh, we see the dangers of religious extremism, um, how blind devotion and blind religious devotion uh, can lead even decent people to do terribly indecent acts, to commit atrocities of violence, uh, because they think that they are righteous. Um, we see the effects of religious extremism in a couple different characters in this. The other major theme that we end up seeing has to do with uh, our knowledge, or the limits of knowledge. Like, what can we actually know? Um, how much can our senses deceive us? Uh, how even reasonable minds can become unreasonable because our senses are tricked. Uh, so those are two major themes that one needs to consider when they go into this. Um, now, the story is largely told from the point of view of a character of Clara, who is the sister of Wieland, um, the, the titular character. And she is recounting events, the tragic events that befell her brother and his family um, and other people that she knew. Uh, and she's telling them after the fact, from her point of view. And that does become significant. Um, Clara is a character that comes off in some instances as fairly reasonable and logical and even brave, although there is a fine line between brave and, you know, uh, brazenly uh, uncautious, um, which is sometimes what she is. Uh, but then she can also sometimes make very frustrating decisions, and she explains things in ways that are not necessarily clear um, and or convincing. Uh, now, Brown has been accused by many people over the years of being sloppy uh, as a writer, um, hasty, hastily writing things, because there are things that you'll find here that are logically inconsistent, or character motivations don't make any sense, um, or there's scenes that are not really clearly explained. You don't want, you know, she talks about faces down by the bottom of the stairs. You don't know what the, she's talking about most of the time. Um, so there's instances there where you're not quite sure how to think about this or feel about this. And people have accused Brown of basically just being a bad writer. Um, now, as I was reading this, and I'm, I'm trying not to give too, way too many spoilers here, so I'm being fairly vague when it comes to the plot. Um, but as I was reading it, I started getting this nudging feeling. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big horror fan. Uh, I'm, I, mean, I mean horror cinema. And I've seen hundreds of films where we have unreliable narrators. You know, where we know that the, the person that we're viewing the movie through, their, their eyes, their, their perception, is skewed, is flawed, is maybe mentally unstable, uh, maybe even completely insane. And I started getting that feeling as I was going through here. But I kept thinking, okay, it's 1798 that this was written. There's no way that Brown was dealing with this. However, 
uh, you know, I was I was reading this with a uh, with a, a nice group. Uh, we've kind of formed a little bit of a, an informal gothic book club. Um, so it's Mark from Book Time with Elvis, Greg from Another Bibliophile Reads, and a BookTube viewer, Sonia De Deveni. Hopefully, I'm saying your name right, Sonia. Um, and we all, I think, have the same kind of feeling that, like, yeah, yeah it's kind of weird this book, you know. Uh, and it was a little frustrating at times. Um, it's also overly written. That's one of the things. It could take Clara a long time to get to the point um, sometimes. But, um, you know, we all kind of, I think, had that feeling. But then I presented this idea, that this nudging idea that I had. Like, well, what if Clara is an unreliable narrator? What if, what if there's something wrong with her? Uh, and it's not Brown's writing that's the problem. It's actually the character who is either lying or is maybe being purposely deceptive, maybe not realizing how deceptive she's being. Maybe she's insane. Maybe she's crazy because of those two themes that I said, right? There's religious extremism, but there's also the limits of knowledge and what can we really know and how much can our senses, uh, you know, fool us. Um, thematically, it would be consistent to have Clara as a character who is not right in the head. Um, and we are trying to piece together what actually happened because maybe she's covering up for something or... Um, she maybe she doesn't know that she's lying. She's not all there. Um, and they all agreed when I presented that idea that that it seemed almost possible. Uh, and it actually made the book a lot more interesting to us. So I started doing some research and uh, I did find a um, doctoral dissertation uh, by uh, was James Richard Rousseau um, that who ended up becoming a successful writer. Um, but in 1979, his dissertation was, I think it was, uh, what was the name of it? Um, I wrote it down over here, whatever the name was. Uh, the Craft of Charles Brockton Brown's Fiction. Uh, and I found it on the um, website of the University of Arizona uh, for the dissertation. And I'll leave a link down below uh, if people want to check it out. But essentially, he says that, no, Clara is a mad woman. Um, and that's how we should approach the fiction of Brown and his writing. He was not sloppy. He was not hasty. He was not a poor plotter. Instead, the character, uh, you know, Brown made the conscious decision to have us see this through Clara's eyes uh, and not, you know, narrate this like a, an impartial, you know, third person. So why would he make that decision, right? Uh, why would he do those things? Why would he put those that, those themes that I talked about in there? Um, and reading the dissertation, I, I read the section at least on Wheeland. I didn't read all the other books that he was talking about. Um, he makes a pretty good case. Uh, it seems highly plausible. Now, I'm not saying that's the only way to read Wieland. Um, I think there's many other valid ways that you can look at Wieland and, you know, <laughs> whatever filter you choose to go through. Um, but I will say that if people haven't read this and they want to, they want to give Wieland a try, keep that in the back of your mind. That's my recommendation, that maybe Clara is insane, okay, that she is not reliable. I do think that if you approach it through that lens, it makes the reading far more interesting and enjoyable. And it is, I think, a valid way to look at it. Not the only way, but it is a valid way to certainly look at it. Brown didn't really write about his own writing, so we'll never know exactly what he intended. Um, he wrote a little bit uh, more, then he ended up kind of giving up on his literary career, and then he, he dies fairly young, unfortunately. Um, but he went on to influence Edgar Allan Poe and many other uh, American writers. So... I do think he deserves the respect and the attention. Um, the previous Gothic book that we had read uh, as a group was The Monk by Matthew Lewis. The Monk is certainly a much more entertaining read. I think it has aged far better than Wieland. Um, we had also read um, The Mysteries of Udolpho. And I kind of, I mean, I liked Mysteries of Udolpho, but it is long. It's a very long book. Uh, and it, it is that's another one where you can get hard to kind of get to the point. Um, at least Wheeland was shorter. Uh, so I'm kind of, Wheeland is kind of a little bit above Mysteries of Udall film for me, especially when I look at it as um, Clara, the character being insane. But it's definitely below the monk at this point. Uh, but I am glad that I read it. And it is inspired by a true story. And from here on out, I am going to be talking a little bit about um, 18th century true crime. So... Uh, there'll be some grisly details that I'm going to mention. Um, and also it will, because I'm talking about what this is based on, uh, this will be a little bit spoilery. Um, if you know the, what it's based on, then you're going to know a major plot event. So just as a warning, 
uh, if you want to go forward, you might have some things brewing for you. Um, but without further delay, we will continue. So this was inspired by a real life murder that took place in 1781 in, I think, Pittston, uh, New York, in upstate New York. Um, a guy named uh, James Yates, who ended up brutally murdering his family, unfortunately. Um, he, he seemed to be okay and a loving father. And then one day, uh, <clears throat> he's at home at night. His wife is with the baby. Uh, he's got, you know, three other uh, small children. <clears throat> he claims that a white light came to him and spoke to him and told him to destroy his idols. And he burned the Bible in the fireplace, and then he ended up grabbing an axe, and he killed the animals, and he destroyed their carriage. Um, and then he started to attack his family. Uh, he had two young sons that he threw against a wall and a chimney and killed them both in that way. He realized that his wife had gone taken off with the baby, uh, running down the road. He ended up catching up to her. I think he threw an axe at her, um, made her drop the baby. Uh, he ends up um, killing her, not with just an axe, but also with a fence post. And he kills the baby as well by throwing it against the fence. Uh, when they found her, they, he had put the baby on top of the mother in the middle of the road. Um, his last child, uh, his daughter, <clears throat> he found hiding in the barn and he had her come out, and then he made her dance around the dead mother until he killed her with an ax. Uh, the next morning, he did try to go to his sister's house and kill her with a knife, but luckily the sister saw the blood all over his hands and was able to subdue him and tie him up. Uh, and then he got sent to a prison in Albany, uh, where I think he might have escaped a few times. Now that, when that happened in 1781, it was not widely reported, but 15 years later, it was published in a magazine <clears throat> in the 1790s. And that's when Brown read about that story. And he ended up, of course, using it as inspiration for uh, the character of Wheeland. Um, so, you know, Yates was never, never sympathetic. He never apologized. He thought that what he did was right because it was righteous. Uh, a divine force had told him to do this, and he was acting basically through the will of God. So, um, yeah, then... Again, you can see where the inspiration for, for Brown would come from. Uh, it also did make me think of something that happened in my own local area uh, a year before the Yates murders. Um, I live on the side of a mountain, and if you go over the mountain and down the mountain into the valley, that's where one of the first American mass murders took place. Uh, a town right now is called Washington Depot. Um, and uh, I wonder if Brown could have possibly also known about this. Um, it's possible that he did. So, in 17, well, in 1779, late 1779, uh, a young man, um, around 19 years old, I think, a guy named Davenport, uh, shows up at a farm, uh, the Mallory Farm, um, by Caleb, Caleb and Jane Mallory, live there with their daughter, daughter-in-law, and their, their grandchildren, and uh, Davenport is destitute, um, and they take pity on him. Uh, they take him on as a farmhand. They don't know that he's a deserter from Washington's army, uh, and that he is also a wanted criminal. Uh, but he lives there for a few months, uh, taking in the family's hospitality and their kindness as they, as they clothe him and give him work and all that. Um, but from a very young age, he had thought about murder uh, and wanted to commit it. And he decides that he's gonna kill the entire family and take their valuables. So in February, around midnight, one night, he grabs a, a candle in one hand, and the other hand he has a, a swingle um, which is a, uh, it's, it's like a wooden blunt instrument used for beating flax. Uh, and he has that in his other hand. Um, and he goes into Caleb and Jane's room where they're sleeping with their seven year old granddaughter. And he starts beating him over the head with this farm instrument. Um, it probably took him a while to die. Uh, the little girl wakes up, she's begging for her life, you know, and she knows him by name. She trusts with this guy. And, he says that he almost felt a little bit of remorse when he killed her, almost. Um, the other, there's other two young grandchildren, they come in crying. Uh, obviously, they seem to have caught on to the fact that something is not right with their grandparents. Um, the daughter and daughter-in-law and stuff, they were out of the house. They were away. Um, so it was just those people inside the house. And he sends those kids back to bed, and they start gathering valuables and 
burns the house down and those kids burn alive inside the house. Uh, so <clears throat> Davenport flees on horseback. He ends up hiding in a swamp for a few days over right where, near where Litchfield is, um, which is a town north of, um, of Washington Depot um, until he's finally caught. And there's a one day trial. He is sentenced to death. <clears throat> I did hear at least one account that Roger Sherman himself, uh, one of the founding fathers, um, author of the Connecticut Compromise, he was part of the, the committee to create the De Declaration of Independence. He signed that. He signed the Constitution, Articles of Confederation before that. He's a pretty prominent founding father that doesn't get enough attention, I think. Uh, but he was actually the one that, the judge that laid down the sentence. Um, and Davenport does end up being hanged. Um, and his body is left to hang there from noon till three. Uh, after, and before that, he had received 39 lashes. Um, now, when he was in prison, uh, there was somebody who took down his confession, um, where he, you know, it laid it all out exactly what he was thinking and how he did it. And that confession ended up getting pretty widely disseminated. Um, I can very easily imagine, you know, Revolutionary War soldiers reading the, reading the confession and having, you know, very strange conversations about it, maybe even people that he knew uh, in the army. Um, so for that reason, it does make me wonder if maybe Brown knew something about this case. Uh, this case was largely forgotten until a local historian found the confession inside some papers um, at the University of Virginia. Uh, and that's how we, we know about it again. Um, it was largely forgotten. Um, but, you know, it is something that, that Brockton Brown might have actually heard about and known. And it took place a year before uh, the Gates murders. Um, so anyhow, that's my, <laughs> my, my dark true crime discussions there from the 18th century. Uh, but it's something that I kept thinking about as I was reading Wieland, um, you know, just knowing that that happened very close to where I live. Um, and some, some similarities there, uh, with the case of Wieland and what really happened, uh, with Davenport. Um, so anyhow, uh, what I recommend ultimately Wieland to people, not to your average reader, I don't think. Um, if you really want to go into the Gothic, I would say yes. But when you do, like I said, I recommend that you look at Clara as somebody who is unreliable and you'll have a much better time uh, with the story. Otherwise, it's not a bad story. It's just not as strong as some of the other stuff. Um, so anyway, those are my thoughts on Charles Brockton Brown and Wieland. If you've read it, I'd love to hear your thoughts. As always, Thank you, BookTube.